You know Elaine? And uh, I do know Elaine. Because Elaine and I go back many years, 42 years ago. I met Elaine in a mission team. She had the better pram, I have to say. <laughs> but uh, I think that mission team changed both our lives. Uh, we had a tremendous time down in Port Patrick. I remember chocolate cake and coffee in the morning. I remember she was a cheat at putting. putting. But uh, Tom Bathgate's great ministry to us really changed both our lives. And I think we're going on because of that. So Elaine and I go back a long way. And you're supposed to say in the way out, you don't look that age. <laughs> Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together. And we do pray this morning we'd have a sense of God, a sense of your spirit moving in our midst and t touching lives and teaching us something from your word that will thrill us and astound us and challenge us and change us. And thank you, Lord, for those times in our lives where we've come into contact with people who've been used to change us. May that happen today. We ask your help and your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak just something a wee bit different today. In fact, if I can just go back one, actually. And it's this. I've been listening to a song, and that's the question of the song. Maybe you've heard it. Is he worthy? You hear a lot of talk about Jesus when you come to church, places like this place. You hear a lot of people speaking about how he changes lives, changes heart, how he gives hope for the future. Is he really all that he's cracked out to be? Is he really special? Is he really unique? Is he really a life-changing savior? Does he have an impact in 2019? And is he worthy, as the Bible would say, of glory and honor and power? Well, when you get to my age and Elaine's age, I can't remember what the difference is. I think I may be a few months more. Yeah, today's question is, what do you think of Jesus? You know, a feature of churches like this in the past was that when you went to a church, there was always a text in the back wall. And it was normally in a scroll. Do you remember that? Uh, and as a kid, you used to try and work, oh, work out how many letters there were. In fact, there's one church near us who had the wrong spelling, and that always astounded me. Uh, yeah, yeah. But a feature of past churches was that, a scroll on the wall and verses like that, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And imagine what a choice. There was a huge quantity of verses available. Anything could have been up there. Anything. They had the choice of all the verses in the Bible. But I'll tell you the three, the three most special ones. Here's the first one. The three favorites were Jesus Christ is Lord and He is. And that was the one that we had in Anbank Gospel Hall. Jesus Christ is Lord. What a statement. What a declaration. What a tremendous truth. No matter what you're going through today, Jesus Christ is Lord and will be Lord forever. Then there's another verse that Christ died for our sins. What a verse. Isn't it tremendous that he took my place and died for me that I may be free? What a tremendous verse. But the one that I came across a lot was, uh, and it's in Old English, just in case you think I've got it wrong, uh, what think ye of Christ? What do you think of Jesus? And that's what I want to really dwell on this morning. What do you think of Jesus Christ? Because that's an important question. I'll tell you why it's an important question. Here's why. What do you think of Jesus? You know, everybody has their opinion about this. Everybody has an opinion about who Jesus is, what Jesus did, how important he is, what part he has, if any, in today's society. Everybody has an opinion. But what you think of Jesus, you know, it's an important question because, well, it was asked, it was asked a number of times in the New Testament. In Matthew 26, it was asked by the high priest Caiaphas. It was asked to the Sanhedrin, to the, to the religious leaders, what do you think of Jesus? And then when you move on uh, towards the cross, it was asked by Pilate, the governor, what do you think of Jesus? This time it was asked not to the leaders, but to the people, what do you think of Jesus? And the response of the people was this. He is worthy of death. They basically said, take him and kill him. Get rid of him. We don't like him. We don't want him. He's nothing to us. And that was their response to that question. He's worthy of death. Jesus also asked that question. If you go back to Matthew 22, he turns and he says, what do you think of Christ? And that's the question I want to ask you this morning. Deep down, what is your opinion of Jesus? Do you love him? 
Do you hate him? Do you trust him? Do you follow him? Do you ridicule him? Do you ignore him? What do you think of Jesus? That's an important question, as I've already said. And I'll tell you why. Because your opinion of Jesus does the following. It affects how you live. If you love Jesus and view him as Lord, you live differently. You live in obedience and submission. Whereas if you think he's just a, a guy from the past, it doesn't affect how you live. But your opinion of Jesus impacts what you say. I was in a train to Glasgow. I was trying to work out whether it was a train or a bus. I've got to that stage, I'm a bit confused. <laughs> There's a point in life, so I'm told, that when it gets to the bus and train, if you're over 65, you get the bus because it's for nothing. And uh, the train, you've got to pay something. So I'm aware of that. Well, it, you know, some of you guys have told me that. Uh, but it affects how you live. It impacts what you say. On the train, I heard this girl, and she just cursed the name of the Lord, and she cursed and took the Lord's name in vain. You know, how you think of Jesus affects how you speak. What you think of Jesus influences your priorities. If you love him, you'll not be at the football match just now. You'll be here. If you trust him, you'll not be at the shops. There's nothing good in the shops anyway. You'll be here. It influences your priorities. What you think of Jesus changes your attitude. We were talking about this yesterday. Somebody phoned up to basically say they weren't prepared to give somebody a lift. And I'm thinking, they're passing their door. You know, if I love Jesus, I'll go the second mile. I'll do what I can. I'll do the best I can. I'll get my way to help people and to be with people. What you think of Jesus affects your outlook, how you view death, how you view life, how you view everything. It affects your outlook. How, what you think of Jesus reaches into every single area of your life and changes it totally. It affects the way you worship. If I don't think a lot of Jesus, I wouldn't sing with joy in my heart. If I don't think much of Jesus, there wouldn't be a thrill in my being. If I don't think much of Jesus, when I take bread and wine, it will mean nothing at all. How you think of Jesus affects everything in your life. But here's the most important one. What you think of Jesus determines your eternal destiny. Is it heaven or is it hell? And that's why I want to ask you this question today. What do you think of Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? You know, following Jesus is a whole life thing. It's from morning to night. It's Monday through to Sunday. It's every day of every year. It's a whole everyday life thing. So can I ask you, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, when people look at you, what do they see? Is it grumpy Bob or greeting Jean? Or is it the beauty? and the love, and the passion, and the compassion of Christ. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. So what do you think of Christ this morning? Well, I've been asked to speak today, this evening, in Isaiah 52 and 53, and I'm going to speak this morning in Isaiah, the end of Isaiah 52, and tonight in Isaiah 53. So please come back tonight, because it would be lonely without you. But you know, Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. And I want to think of his view of Jesus this morning. You know, long before the birth of Jesus, and some amazing things happened, long before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah, who was born, you know, 600 years before Jesus was born, he reveals the messenger that God would send. And he says in Isaiah chapter 9, unto as a son is given, unto as a child is born, the government will be on his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of Peace. And before Jesus is born, many, many years, Isaiah reveals that God would be sending a messenger. Before Jesus is born, Isaiah reveals the message that he would bring. And we find that later on in his passage of how lovely in the mountains are those who uh, will bring good news who declare that your God reigns. Isaiah also reveals the type of death he would die. We're looking at that this evening. The cross, the crucifixion, the suffering, his substitutionary death for you and for me. And Isaiah also reveals the following, the honor he would be given. That Jesus would not be ever dead. That he would rise and be given a place of glory and honor and power. Isaiah looked ahead and he saw that. And he was amazed by it. And I want to read to you Isaiah 52 in God's Word version. It says the following, My servant will be successful. He will be respected, praised, and highly honored. 
Many will be shocked by him. His appearance will be so disfigured that he will, won't look like any other man. His looks will be so disfigured that he will hardly look like a human. He will cleanse many nations with his blood. And kings will shut their mouths because of him. They will see things that they've never been told. And they will understand things that they'd never heard. Wow. And that's what Isaiah, looking ahead, years and years ahead, sees and speaks about Christ. He'll be successful. But many will be shocked by his appearance because he'll be disfigured. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, and many will, he'll cleanse many nations with his blood. Let's think about that for a moment. Here's Isaiah's understanding of Jesus and what was being said there. This is the, what Isaiah sees, and it's astounding. He looks ahead. And he says, God is a plan for the redemption of the world. Isn't that fantastic? God is a plan. Our world is going somewhere. It's not in the hands of Trump, hallelujah. And it's not in the hands of Boris, that'd be confusion. Okay, but God's got a plan for the world. We used to sing when I was Elaine's age, and she was my age, down there with the kids at Port Patrick. He's got the whole world in his hand, and he does. Because, praise God, God's got a plan for the world. Let me share it with you. That plan involved the coming of Christ. And we're heading, somebody was telling me yesterday, 12 weeks to Christmas. I had my first text from my daughter, the sensible one in the family, saying, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? Wow. Yeah. So I've my order for a new BMW. I don't think I'll get it, though. Okay. Uh, but God has a plan. It involved the coming of Christ. God has a plan. It involved the dying of Christ. Calvary wasn't an accident. The cross wasn't a mistake. That was part of God's plan. God's got a plan. It involved the rising, the resurrection of Christ from the grave. Hallelujah. He's risen and he's living. God's got a plan. It involved the ascension of Christ, him rising and going back into heaven to sit at the right hand of the majesty and high. God's got a plan. Yes. It involved the crowning of Christ as King and Lord and God. And yes, today, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah was amazed at what God was about to do. Are you amazed at what God has done? Are you thrilled by that story? He came, he died, he rose, he ascended, he's on the throne. Hey guys, there's more. He's coming again. Isn't that tremendous? Are you amazed at what God has done? Isaiah was. And you know, God's perfect plan was Jesus. Wow. Are you here to worship this morning? Are you here to praise? God's perfect plan to redeem the world, to transform your life, your home, your family, was Jesus. What do you think of Jesus this morning? Do you love him? Are you following him? Do you trust him? What think ye of Christ? You know, Isaiah saw four, 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 four truths in that chapter that we've read together. Four truths. The first thing he saw, the depth of Jesus' suffering. He saw the depth. He saw how deep, how hard, how awful it would be. And we've read that in the chapter. He saw the depth of the suffering of Jesus. He speaks there about his visage being marred more than any man. He basically would be unrecognizable because of taking such a beating. And that should astonish men. But he bore that for me. And he bore that for you. He took the pain and the agony and the suffering of the cross for you. And to me, are you astonished this morning at what Jesus has done? Isaiah's second truth is the effect of Jesus' sacrifice. It says there that he would be used to cleanse many. That's what it says. He will sprinkle and cleanse many nations. Many people will be cleansed of sin, forgiven, redeemed, pardoned because of that cross, because of his suffering. And that should humble us this morning that there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the door of heaven to let us in. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. That should humble us this morning. We should want to fall in worship. You know, the, the third truth that Isaiah saw was the wonder of his victory. It says there, in, again, in Isaiah 52, verses 13 onwards, he will be raised up and highly exalted. Yes, 
despite what he went through, he would gain the victory. He would triumph to the end. That should startle men. They nailed him to a cross. They take his name in vain, and yet he's obtained the victory. That should stun men into repentance. And the fourth truth is the splendor of Jesus' reign. He speaks in these verses that basically he will take the the glory, he will take the throne, and he will reign forever. And that should silence men. Big talkers, they're all the same. The leaders of foreign nations, the leaders of North Korea and other places, no, they feel that they're in charge, but they're not. Because Jesus reigns. He is Lord. How has Jesus impacted you this morning? What impact has he had in your life and in my life today? I wonder. You may wonder why I'm showing you that. Because that's somebody looking at a picture on a telephone. Well, it's amazing, the picture that Isaiah had of Christ. An amazing picture. Long before he came, long before he was born, and he shares that so that you would grasp how wonderful and great and magnificent and planned the coming and death of Jesus is. The chorus says, this is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Are you doing that? Is that your response? Worship, service, submission, obedience to the servant king. When you think of all that Jesus has done, does it touch your heart and touch your life and touch your being and touch what you are and touch what you do? It should do. But I want to move on and hopefully it won't be too long. I want to look very quickly at a New New Testament disciple's view of Jesus. And we won't have time to read the verses, but one of the disciples who was very close to Jesus was the disciple John. And I'm sure you know that He wrote a book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when John wrote his epistles, which is another group of letters he wrote, he tells us what he thought of Jesus Christ. And he says this, he says, and we don't have time to read these verses, but look them up when you get home. Jesus is life. He's life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you look through the Gospels, Jesus speaks about life. Because that's what people need, and that's what you need, eternal life. Jesus is life. He also speaks about light, that he's the light of the world, and in him we see light, and in him there is light. He's the light. He's the one that can show us the way to God, the way ahead, the way to live, the way to die. He's the light. He also would tell us that Jesus is love. That's why he went to the cross. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us all the features of love, and you can add it it at the end. All of it points to Jesus, because he's love. He's life, he's light, he's love, but he's God. And John, when he writes to Christians, says, I want you to grasp this. I want you to grasp how great Jesus is. He's life, he's light, he's love, but he's God. What do you think of him this morning? What do you think of Jesus? Have you fallen down before him like Thomas did and said, my Lord and my God? He's all these things. But it also says, John also writes to his readers and he says, he who has the Son has life. If you want life, eternal life, if you want a hope and a future, if you want a purpose in the present, you know, you can't do that without Christ. If you have Jesus, you have life. So what do you think of Christ this this morning? What do you think of him? Love, light, and life, all found in Jesus. But where am I going? Well, I believe that John had great insight into who Jesus was. You know, when we come to the end of the Bible, we find that John's away from his family. He's away from his friends. And here's why. He's imprisoned on an island called Patmos. And uh, he's a captive. He's a prisoner. He's an outcast. And there he is with his handcuffs on. But why am I telling you this? Well, in that place of hardship and tears, in that horrible place to be, he pens what the Bible calls the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation, the revealing of Jesus. And you know, in that place, that horrible place of hardship and hard, real hard times, when he's lost and isolated and sad, and you'd think he'd be lonely, he learns how wonderful 
And he learns how great. And he learns how special. And he learns how unique. And he learns how beyond compare Jesus is. And here's some words that he wrote. I just want to take some of them to you today. Revelation chapter 5. He says, Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth was found worthy. And I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, and succored by the four living creatures and the elders. And he continues, Then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders with a loud voice. They were saying these words, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I looked and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits in the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and forever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Isaiah gave us a picture of his coming, of his death, of his resurrection. And on that island, John gets a picture of his glory, of his greatness. John was the New Testament disciple who saw Jesus and he learned how wonderful Jesus was and Jesus is. It's funny how when you look at these passages, you see this, that God rated Jesus and the angels rated Jesus, he's worthy, they said. And heaven rated Jesus, they sang a new song, they sang a song of praise to the Lamb. And Isaiah rated Jesus and John rated Jesus. Can I ask you, what do you think of Christ this morning? What do you think of Jesus this morning? Do you rate him? You know, Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of your life. He's worthy of your heart. He's worthy of your all. He's worthy of everything. The Bible says he's worthy of glory and honor and praise. What do you think of Jesus this morning? What's my conclusion as we come to the end? Now, my conclusion is this. We've looked at two men today, Isaiah and John. These two men were from different backgrounds. You you know it's coming near the end when my my PowerPoints go faster. (laughs) Okay, two men from very different backgrounds, two men from different eras of time, two men from different worlds, very different worlds, one Old Testament, one New. Things had progressed somewhat between them. Two men with different life experiences. Two men... Reach one conclusion. Here it is. That he's worthy. (laughs) Father, we acknowledge this morning that he's worthy. Worthy to be thanked and praised and worshipped and adored. And we bow in adoration at all that Jesus has done. Lord, take our lives and our hearts and help us to live in that spirit of appreciation for Jesus touch all of us this morning and may we leave here saying he is he's worthy he's worthy in jesus name amen